uh, good afternoon. Uh, we just heard this uh, case which I think presented about a gentleman with bipolar depression, uh, type 2. Uh, he's had multiple episodes of depression and had uh, one episode of hypomania. And when we discussed this case, more or less we discussed what could be the evidence-based management for bipolar disorder in a, in a, in broad, in a broader, broader term. What I would be doing right now is to give you an idea about I mean, brief outline regarding what is the current status of evidence as far as the management of bipolar depression goes. Uh, this will be the outline. We will first talk about the scope of the problem. Why do we need to discuss about this? Is there a distinction between unipolar and bipolar as far as the phenomenology goes? What are the treatment options in acute phase as well as the maintenance phase? The options that are available are mood stabilizers, atypical antipsychotic medications, what is the role of antidepressants and what are the controversies that surround the use of antidepressant medications? Are there newer drugs to treat bipolar depression and the role of somatic treatments like ECT and TMS? And what do the treatment guidelines talk about? So this is the scope of the problem. I'm quoting from uh, the NIMH Collaborative Depression Study, which was published more than a decade ago. And there were two papers on one on bipolar 1 and one on bipolar 2 by Jude and colleagues. And this uh, graph, this pie chart talks about the proportion of time that is occupied <coughs> by depression. Um, as you can see here, depression occupies a significant proportion of the course of uh, bipolar disorder, be it bipolar 1 or 2. What does, it, what does it entail? It causes a greater psychosocial impairment than manic symptoms because uh, mania produces disruptive symptoms, but the disruption that happens to various aspects of life such as work, social uh, social life, leisure, family life, etc. as shown in the disability is much higher for depressive episodes in comparison to manic episodes. Um, can you distinguish bipolar from unipolar? This is a very classical table that you take from the textbooks about how you can differentiate bipolar and unipolar depression. Of course, it is defined by the presence of manic or hypomanic episodes in bipolar disorder. That's probably the most important aspect. Then. You can talk about the temperament. In, in bipolar depression, cyclothymic and hyperthymic temperaments are common. Usually sex ratio is equal in bipolar, uh, whereas in unipolar depression, you find a preponderance of females. Age of onset is slightly earlier in bipolar depression in comparison to unipolar. Onset episode tends to be acute, if not abrupt. And uh, the number of episodes are pretty numerous. And the duration of episodes is around three to six months. And the case that, we, that uh, was presented previously also talks about how there were brief episodes and the number of episodes were also pretty much pretty high. Postpartum episodes are common in bipolar depression. Psychotic symptoms might be greater. Psychomotor activity reduction and psychomotor retardation might be commoner in bipolar depression. And reversal of vegetative signs such as hypersomnia is a common feature that you see in bipolar depression. So this is just a probably a, a refreshment of what we would have uh, seen in many of the textbooks previously. What are the important considerations that you need to keep in mind when we treat bipolar depression? The primary goal of pharmacotherapy is effectiveness in both acute phase as well as maintenance phase of the illness. Uh, there are concerns related to adapting evidence from unipolar depression. It's because it's very difficult to adapt the guidelines from unipolar depression into uh, the treatment of bipolar depression. And in addition, there are inherent concerns in using antidepressants in bipolar disorder, as somebody pointed out previously about the use of, about the possibilities of switch in, uh, in bipolar disorder, as well as the possibility of cycle acceleration. And efficacy of mood stabilizers in the treatment of depression appears to be suboptimal. When you look at what is the substrate for improvement with mood stabilizer, you find that somehow mania or uh, other symptoms seem to improve better in comparison to depressive episodes. There are some risk factors which we need to keep in mind, such as a non-adherence to medication, which probably tops the list. Comorbid substance abuse, which is something which is highlighted in the case which was presented previously mood incongruent psychotic symptoms, greater number of prior episodes, poor response to treatment, inter-episodic residual symptoms, they seem to predict further episodes and longer duration of hospitalization. So these are probably the robust risk factors for relapses or recurrences of uh, bipolar disorder. And treatment adherence is a major concern and most of the RCTs uh, for medications in bipolar disorder, non-adherence rates are pretty high, close to 20 to 35 percent rate, which is quite a high number. 
Now we'll come to the treatment options that are available for acute bipolar depression. Um, we will start with mood stabilizers and probably the most uh, important and the most useful mood stabilizer that we uh, know of, which is lithium. Evidence for lithium, uh, unfortunately, has been um, has been pretty old, probably because um, subsequently there has been uh, no most most of the pharmaceutical industry has not been really keen to do studies with lithium subsequently. So uh, most of the evidence with lithium are in 1990s, and the latest one, uh, most of them were the early 2000s. And the review of uh, studies with lithium and placebo involving large number of patients shows a detectable response in treating bipolar depression as well. And uh, Jameson and Woodwin's studies, uh, pre previous studies have also shown that uh, there are significant antidepressant effects with lithium. And these individual studies were small in number, uh, but even then there were small, small multiple studies which were conducted in 90s. Other later studies for lithium, there have been some of the examples of later studies in lithium which has shown mixed evidence. Uh, Emboldened one is one named study which is uh, which comprised of a large number of participants with bipolar 1 and 2, with quetiapin and lithium being tested and compared against placebo. And quetiapin was found to be more effective than placebo, whereas lithium did not fare as well, uh, and it did not differ so much from placebo in the, on the main uh, outcome measures. This is yet another study, uh, which examined the efficacy and safety of uh, paroxetin and imipramine with that of placebo in patients with bipolar depression, stabilized on a regimen of lithium and they found that the overall efficacy amongst the three groups were not statistically significant for patients who were on high serum lithium uh, levels, antidepressant response at endpoints did not differ significantly. Meaning to say that when mood stabilization is adequate, that itself took care of uh, the depression and it, it did not really require additional antidepressant medications to say that lithium was useful. So there have been mixed reports about the use of lithium in the subsequent uh, period. There have been some specific benefits attributed to lithium, and the, it is probably the only anti the only agent which has got anti suicidal treatment with randomized evidence in reduction in the risk of suicide of more than 50 percentage. And um, more or less, it has got benefit in various stages of bipolar disorder, and the long term mood stabilizing property also appears to be good. Coming to lamotrigine. Uh, this is an agent which is very frequently published, uh, uh, frequently uh, written or prescribed, but uh, this is a review of lamotrigine in acute treatment of bipolar depression uh, from five double-blind placebo-controlled clinical trials and the, most of the trials were conducted, conducted by Calabrese's uh, uh, Calabri's colleagues. And here, what was found is that lamotrigine monotherapy did not differ from placebo with respect to primary efficacy endpoints, which is which actually goes against a couple of initial studies of lamotrigine, which actually gave a positive, uh, positive uh, result for lamotrigine. But overall, when we looked at look at most of the studies, most of the five studies combined together, the uh, the, the lamotrigine did, monotherapy did not achieve a significance, and sample sizes were relatively small to detect uh, the treatment effects, and there were large placebo effects. And this is a subsequent meta-analysis of the five randomized trials. And here, what was found is that lamotrigine was superior in people who had higher depression scores, but not in people who had a lesser depression scores. So that is something which is quite interesting when people have a significant depressive, people have significant depressive symptoms, maybe lamotrigine also has a role to play in bipolar depression. Valproate, a very, very common uh, element in the prescription in bipolar uh, disorder. To date, there has been no large double-blind placebo control study supporting divalproate or valproate in bipolar depression and it has been found to be effective in acute depression in almost small trials a couple of them are unpublished but to say to summarize the first statement is that there are no large trials to say and hence valproate might not be an agent which which can be cited with a lot of uh, evidence the other mood stabilizers have poor evidence support again, only at the level of uncontrolled uh, studies or case reports. Carbamazepine is one, topiramate, oxcarbazepine, all of them have very, very small studies, but then the evidence support appears to be very, very meager. Coming to atypical antipsychotics, uh, we'll start with olanzapine uh, fluoxepine combination. This is the initial paper which gathered a lot of interest by Tohin and colleagues, and it was a uh, double-blind randomized control study with multi, which was multi-centric 
and uh, looking at the primary outcome measure of uh, mattress score as you can see in the picture the olanzapin fluoxetine group had a significant benefit by the end of 8 week of treatment in comparison to placebo and when you look at the response and remission criteria you can see that uh, the combination uh, treatment had a significant benefit over placebo it also had a benefit over the olanzapin plain olanzapin arm as well now uh, there was a recent review uh, out around 2 or 3 years back on olanzapin fluoxetine combination for bipolar disorder what was found is that uh, there are hardly four studies on it and uh, it definitely has an edge uh, in the treatment of acute bipolar depression there are significant improvements in outcomes such as response remission relapse rate in bipolar depression related to others there has not been increase in manic episodes but like it was pointed out previously a greater metabolic concern such as an increase in weight has been noted in majority of the studies and hence that is one caution in the use of olanzapin uh, fluoxetine combination coming to the next agent of uh, interest is quetiapine uh, this molecule was tested uh, in a couple of large trials one is called bolder one wherein a uh, dose of 300 mg 600 mg was compared against placebo and what was found is that both the doses 300 as well as 600 mg fared better in comparison to placebo so to say that even 300 mg is actually a good enough dosage to treat acute bipolar depression this was an ex uh, then there was an extension of the previous study there was a larger number with larger number of participants again the results were almost replicated with the quetiapine arm uh, with both 300 and 600 mg uh, quetiapine showing a benefit in comparison to placebo this is another in interesting study which examined quetiapine in comparison to paroxetine in bipolar 1 and 2 and what was found is that quetiapine was found to be superior over both paroxetine as well as placebo and paroxetine did not have a significant difference from the placebo arm so to say that antidepressant did not really help and atypical antipsychotic actually had a better edge over antidepressants in this particular study now uh, coming to antidepressants is something which we never forget even the moment somebody comes with depression even if it's bipolar depression there are a lot of occasions when we tend to write antidepressants Uh, is monotherapy advised the answer is definitely no it is generally not advised there have been some small positive studies on antidepressants as monotherapy in bipolar 2 especially and there were many studies which were very small with no placebo control uh, but the negative studies were the ones which were which i discussed previously there were larger studies so one can believe that a monotherapy probably is not effective in, in the context of bipolar depression and with a mood stabilizer there have been small studies which have shown improvement there have been some studies wherein it has not shown improvement as well including a recent meta analysis which pointed towards the uh, negative uh, the negative result with antidepressant medication so this is the step bd study is a landmark study on effectiveness of an adjunctive antidepressant treatment on bipolar uh, depression which came in nigm and uh, mood stabilizer with antidepressant which was either paroxetine or bupropion versus mood stabilizer and placebo what was found was that the recovery rates were almost uh, similar so to say that probably mood antidepressant did not really have an additional advantage uh, when combined along with the mood stabilizer especially when the mood stabilizer dose the serum levels were adequate uh now regarding antidepressant medications there are a couple of concerns which was pointed out previously as well about the safety the acute safety concern is switching whereas a long term safety concern appears to be mood destabilization or the rapid cycling evolution of a greater number of uh, i mean the shortening of the cycle is another concern which is noted uh when somebody comes to you with unipolar depression is there a chance that this person would what is the chance that this person would enter into a bipolar depression so the possibility has been approximately 8 percentage in newly diagnosed patients with unipolar depression this was a interesting paper which examined the transition from unipolar to bipolar now within bipolar itself what are the chances of people and undergoing switches most of the estimates are based upon tricyclic data from bipolar 1 which rates which actually shows a very high uh, estimate of about 20 to 30 percentage whereas lower switch rates with newer antidepressants such as uh, ssris and bupropion has been shown approximately 5 percentage 
and probably the switch rate with bipolar 2 appears to be lesser. Dosing and switching has not been proven to have a robust relationship. This is probably the largest meta-analysis of antidepressant associated hypomania or mania wherein multiple subjects have been enrolled over multiple or more than 100 trials, antidepressant trials. The overall incidence of antidepressant induced mania or hypomania was 12.5 and the curious point here is that the co-therapy with anti-manic drugs did not appreciably lower the overall risk of switching as well. So there is there's definite, there's definite concern which is seen in people who uh, are prescribed concomitant uh, antidepressants. Are there some risk factors for antidepressant induced mania? It appears to be younger age, bipolar 1 more than 2, rapid cycling uh, in the past one year, mixed depression, the use of tricyclics and norepinephrine agents such as venlafaxine for example and history of substance abuse. So these factors tend to be the risk factors for antidepressant induced mania. Coming to the newer molecule of which has given a lot of interest which was recently launched in India. It's a second generation antipsychotic lurazidone and it has been approved by the US FDA for the treatment of bipolar depression. It has got an interesting mechanism like any other, any other atypical antipsychotic, it, it produces a D2 blocket as well as 5-HT2A blocket and along with that it also has a partial agonism at 5-HT1A and that is considered to be the reason for both the cognitive benefits as well as antidepressant benefits. In addition, 5-HT7 antagonism appears to be mediating the depressive uh, antidepressant action. It has been tried in studies with monotherapy of 80 to 120 milligrams and adjunctive dosage of 20 to 60 milligrams a day. This is the evidence that is available from Label and uh, colleagues. And this is the monotherapy. As far as the monotherapy goes, you can see both the low dose. Low dose means uh, 20 to 60 and high dose is uh, 80 to 120 milligrams per day. Both the dosages fared better in comparison to placebo as monotherapy, as well as in add on with mood stabilizer, it was tried with 20 to 80 milligrams per day. That also was found to be better in comparison to the placebo combination. So, the other agents which I'm not going into details as far as evidence goes are pramipexole. There are upcoming studies on pramipexole in a randomized manner as well in bipolar depression from the CANMAD group. And modafinil, which is a stimulant, also has been tried. IV ketamine has been tried in multiple studies, but the difficulty with IV ketamine has been that it, even though it produces rapid benefit, the effect has not been really sustained. Is ECT an option for people with bipolar disorder? Uh, there has been a comparison on the efficacy of electroconvulsive therapy in bipolar versus unipolar major depression. And this meta-analysis concluded that the overall remission rate appears to be similar, no significant difference in the number of ECTs required to reach the response and remission criteria. And uh, maybe a little bit on RTMS, there has been a recent meta-analysis on uh, RTMS in bipolar depression. And the result shows that uh, active left frontal uh, RTMS, over, uh, active low frequency RTMS over the right DLPFC appears to be significantly better than sham. And even high, fre high frequency RTMS over the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex was superior to sham. So to say that there are multiple studies, in fact, which actually has examined this particular question. In, in uh, Some of the studies have examined samples with both unipolar and bipolar. But the overall efficacy appears to be okay. It appears to be modest, if not fantastic. Uh, this is the CANMAT guidelines for bipolar disorder, which is updated in 2013. And the first line... Uh, treatments which has been suggested are the monotherapy with lithium, lamotrigine, vitapin as well as vitapin extended release. Combination therapy has been approved with lithium with SSRI, zolanzapin, lithium divalproate or lithium and bupropion. And there has been second line treatment with lurazidone probably because lurazidone the trials are hardly two trials at this, at this point of time and that is good enough for an FDA approval but there are more uh, trials required to establish its efficacy in future. Uh, recommendations for acute bipolar 2 depression, the first line appears to be quitapin. So uh, in this case, which we discussed probably, one, uh, as we have, as we discussed previously, quitapin appears to be a good choice as far as the recommendations also go. So SSRIs uh, plus mood stabilizers has been suggested by NICE guidelines, whereas APA plays, a bit, uh, plays it a bit defensive and olanzapine and quitapin are considered to be uh, the 
better treatment options as far as APA guidelines go. So this is a summary of uh, acute bipolar uh, depression treatment. One, can, one needs to optimize the dose of mood stabilizers, particularly with lithium. Quetiapin is the next op is an option. Olanzapine fluoxetine uh, combination is approved. Lemotrigine uh, evidence is not fantastic. It has an evidence for prevention of uh, depression, but not so much for the treatment of acute bipolar depression. Lurazidone is upcoming. SSRIs with mood stabilizers and ECT in certain select conditions. And the caution is to use antidepressants always in combination with uh, mood stabilizers and uh, or anti antimanic medications. Coming to maintenance treatment, is there a real need for maintenance treatment in the context of bipolar depression? The answer is yes, because uh, people who continue on medications versus people who discontinue medication, there was a examine, exam, it was examined whether what, what is the chance of a relapse. As you can see here, the relapse rates are pretty much higher at the moment somebody discontinues medications. Lithium, uh, age old studies with lithium has shown some benefit in prevention of depression, but there are small, small studies which have examined it independently and it is found to, it is found to be useful in prevention of both mania as well as depression. Valproate, the evidence for valproate in bipolar depression prophylaxis also appears to be limited. And there is one small study which examined uh, this question and it says there could be a role in prevention of depression and mania in a 12 month follow up study, but again, it is not a very conclusive evidence that the study told us. Coming to atypical antipsychotics, olanzapine, compared to placebo, there has been studies and it has been shown to be useful. Compared to mood stabilizer, they seem to have a non-inferiority at least. And the olanzapine fluoxetine combination maintenance, longer term studies suggest that both olanzapine alone and uh, olanzapine fluoxetine combination may be effective in maintenance treatment and 24 uh, week Open label studies from the previous randomized control studies are the ones which give us this data. Lemotrigine appears to be useful in the maintenance phase based upon the previous uh, studies. So, lemotrigine is considered to be superior to placebo at uh, prolonging the time to a depressive episode. So, lemotrigine can be an option if you are looking at prevention of a further episode of uh, depression. So, the maintenance efficacy, the summary would be that lemotrigine, olanzapine, olanzapine fluoxetine combination. Which have been, there have been some extension studies of RCTs and to some extent, yes, lithium. So this, these are the medications which you would think about in order to prevent an episode of depression. Now, there are some methodological concerns uh, as far as the maintenance studies goes. The caveat is that the maintenance studies have enrolled enriched populations of patients who are currently or recently manic or mixed. Now, there have been very few studies that have enrolled patients with index depressive episodes. So that produces a bias here that the polarity of index episodes tends to predict the polarity of the relapse into a subsequent episode. That's a well-known fact. So in that context, so many of the maintenance studies might not be giving a real, real answer for a maintenance question. And there are no maintenance studies of olanzapine fluoxetine combination, vitapin or lurazidone that have enrolled patients with an index episode of acute bipolar depression. And uh, probably these are not the least, uh, uh, this probably is not the last, even though it's the last slide, uh, these are the most important aspects of which needs to go in. Uh, the psychosocial interventions, especially in the case which we discussed previously has uh, substance uh, dependence, so uh, relapse prevention, education relate, uh, related to how substance can, can result in an episode of uh, depression or a mania. It's, so psychoeducation forms an important aspect of the treatment. Uh, cognitive behavior therapy, family focused therapy, IP, SRP, interpersonal social rhythm therapy. These are the evidence-based strategies used in the prevention of uh, bipolar depression. So to conclude, uh, so the, the first aspect should be to optimize the dose of mode stabilizer. I would say lithium, even though the lithium evidence has not been from very large studies, the evidence can be gathered from small studies, but then they have accumulated over so many years. So lithium would definitely figure in as a mode stabilizer in the context of bipolar depression. For acute bipolar depression, uh, quetiapin, lurazidone, olanzapine fluoxetine combination, SSRIs with mode stabilizers and ECT form the options. The potential options for maintenance would include mode stabilizer plus lamotrigine, quetiapin, mode stabilizer plus quetiapin, uh, olanzapine fluoxetine, as well as olanzapine. So antidepressants are always to be given in combination with mode stabilizer or antimanic drugs. Psychosocial interventions would play an important role uh, as a concurrent uh, treatment option. Thank you.